Hello, hello, this is Crypto Economics and Introduction Chapter 1. We are finally getting started. And so, we've uh, Chapter 1, we're going to be talking about a central payment processor, how to implement it, what are the tools required, and we've got five nice sections. And, and so first, this video is going to provide an overview of what the central payment processor does and all of the different concepts, which we're going to dive into more detail in each one of the sections. So what are these concepts? So, let's start, of course, we are creating the central payment processor side of, 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 of this, this um, project. And that's going to guide us through, through our exploration of crypto economics. So first, we've got this central payment processor. Maybe it's a computer you know, data center on AWS, whatever it is. And then we've got all of our different users, you know, Alice, Bob, Aparna, Jing, Carl, you know, many more. Um, and each one of them has a computer and they've got a little private key. And so we're going to talk about all these things later. But anyway, first, let's look at what the balance, what the uh, central payment processor is storing, the, the information. So they are storing, of course, balances. And these balances represent the money, how much money everyone has, right? $55, $35, etc. And they're also storing nonces. And so these nonces are not nonsense. They are the number of transactions that everyone has sent. So, for instance, Alice, the first one, has sent one transaction, and Bob has sent three transactions. And so we're, we're keeping track of this number, and we'll explain why a little later. Now, balances, you will notice these numbers, 171, corresponds to 171 on Alice's computer, so her address. And so we can actually fill in the details if we cross-reference the, the, those numbers. We can fill in who is who. And now, the interesting thing is this is actually like where the blockchain pseudo-anonymity uh, um, comes from, because you don't actually know who is who unless you know that Carl controls 6E2. You wouldn't know who 6E2 is. It doesn't say Carl, it says 6E2. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that stuff soon too. Now, just as a little, you know, quick overview, this, this is a number, right? This 0x just means it is hexadecimal instead of decimal. So decimal, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And in hexadecimal, it's very similar. It's just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, up until F, and then we go to 10. So, you know, you can look up how hexadecimal works if you want. It's good stuff. It's very simple. We should have used hex for everything. Anyway, it's all just numbers. Everything's numbers. Words are numbers. It's all numbers. So <laughs> now let's let's see a l couple use cases. You know, what are what are how does the system actually work on a high level? So first, let's say Alice will ask the central server what what's her balance. And Alice will also sign this message providing a signature. It's a very you can just for now just think of it as a written signature just to make sure that it is in fact Alice. Now we're going to go over this in more detail in section 1.1 with hashes and signatures some really fundamental crypto concepts. Now, the central payment processor will grab the signature, check to make sure that it's right, boom, checks out, and check, look up Alice's balance, and return. 55 bucks. Alice now knows how much money she's got. And Alice is going to actually check the signature to make sure that they, the message that she received wasn't from some rando. It was actually from the central payment processor, the only person who really matters, whose opinion really matters in this case, because we're centralized. Um, so now Alice is going to send her first real transaction. This is the first transaction that updates balances. And so this transaction is going to be part of a, a we're, we're going to talk about where this transaction, how the transactions look, and, and uh, you know what is the state, all of these kinds of details in section 1.2 where we go over the payment processor implementation um, now first we are going to see okay who is she sending it to well it's BC1 BC1 corresponds to Jing's address and so great we, we've, we, we know we know who she's you know Alice is trying to send ten dollars to Jing the payment processor might not even know who Jing is. But anyway, the next thing the payment processor will do is check the signature. You know, make sure that it's correct. Okay, great, it's correct. Now, the next thing is the nonce. So this is where the nonces come in. The payment processor will cross-reference these this list of nonces. So we'll, we'll see, okay, pull in the, the, that one, check to see what these these two are the nonce should equal the expected nonce this list says okay this is the number the nonce that i expect the next transaction i receive from each one of these people to be so i expect that 
the nonce will be one for for Alice, and I'm gonna check that the nonce is one. One equals one. Great. This is preventing against resubmitting the same transaction multiple times. And so we're gonna go over this in more detail in section 1.3, where we talk about replay protection for single transactions and even replay protection between different chains and payment processors. But this is it's a fun topic. Um, now, great. So it, it checks out, and the nonce is correct. Um, and then we're going to increment the nonce because, of course, first we expected the nonce to be one. Now that we've received a transaction with nonce one, we expect the next nonce to be two and so on and so forth up until, you know, infinity. Um, now, we go back to the balances. We check to see that they have enough money, right? Ten dollars. We, we need at least ten. It does. And so we actually update the balances, right? Minus ten and, min and plus ten. Um, now, we're going to go over multiple different ways of updating balances and, and keeping track of the state. Currently, we're using the account model, and we're actually going to also review UTXO model, which is something that's used in Bitcoin, unspent transaction outputs. And so we'll, we'll, we'll have fun there, too. Now, uh, 45, 95, etc., and we've, you know, success. And we check the signature once again to make sure that it really is the central payment processor that said success, and it is, so we're good. Now we're going to try resubmitting the transaction. So this is where replay protection comes in, not to spoil it. Um, so we check the signature, goes, goes through, and now we're going to check the nonce. We're going to say, okay, is one equal to two? Well, it's a hard math problem, but no, it is not equal to two in case you didn't, didn't figure that out yourself. So invalid nonce, right? There, then we check the transaction signature, and boom. So great, we're, we're, we are prevented, we, we have prevented a replay attack. Um, now, number two, we're going to try to send $50 to Jing this time. So we're going to check the signature. Signature checks out. Great. Next, we're going to check the nonce. The nonce, OK, hmm, 2 equals 2. Great. Now we're going to do 2 plus 1. Three. So we want to make sure that all the transactions that we receive, we're going to update the nonce. Now we're going to do a final thing where we check the actual balance. And that 45 is less than 50. So the transaction is not going to go through. And so we're going to return an error message saying insignificant balance, I mean insufficient balance, and check the signature. Boom. We just prevented an invalid spend. Now, Alice impersonators. So this time we're going to see someone try to send a transaction on Alice's behalf, but who doesn't actually have the same key or the same address as Alice. So it's going to fail. Well, spoiler alert. Um, anyway, so we're going to try this out. So the, the nonce looks pretty correct. However, this signature is looking a little funky, right? We don't actually have the private key. So the, the central payment processor is going to look at that signature, be like, no, that is not Alice. Get out of here. Invalid signature. Bam, bam, bam. We just got rid of that, ugh, that nasty impersonator. <sighs> Good grief. Um, anyway, so yay, we've done it. Um, we've we've kind of go, gone over the, the general operations of a central payment processor. I mean, what does a central payment processor really need? It needs to be able to, you know, have a bunch of users. Those users are able to send each other money, and the central payment processor can facilitate that, that those transactions. And so, great, it's pretty simple. Um, but, you know, we're also going to go over some of the, you know, properties and maybe some of the downsides of using a central payment processor. Um, in section 1.5 and so that's that's basically it for the overview it's time to dive into each one of the the sections and if you know if you want to skip one or you want to like you know blah 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 please feel free hopefully this kind of organization makes makes some sense anyway that's all folks but up but but up I don't know I'm gonna need a catchphrase for the end of my videos <laughs> see ya <laughs>